Hey, baby. When are you coming home? It's starting to get dark outside. It's late. I've been at the library in Boston all day. Hey, do you remember that one time from years and years ago, that seance when I asked about werewolves <clears throat> and they told me um, about these ancient werewolf packs and then it kind of led me into Ed and Lorraine Warren's werewolf case. Do you remember? Maybe I'm having a hard time hearing you. Are you there? Hello? What if cryptids, extraterrestrials, Sasquatch, werewolves, and more are really truly just hiding in plain sight? I mean, clearly, ghost angels and demons exist and they communicate. And I'm recording their voices while they are literally hiding in plain sight. What does this mean? What else is out there? A few references to men changing into wolves are found in ancient Greek literature and mythology. They were transformed into wolves once every year for several days and then changed back to their human shape. There are so many stories about werewolves all throughout history. But to encounter unseen entities talking about werewolves, vampires, Sasquatch, other beasts, cryptids, maybe even good entities, aliens, extraterrestrials, this is like a whole nother level of adding to history. I've encountered unseen entities speaking of ghosts, demons, devils, angels, werewolves, vampires, other cryptids. Now it's just a matter of what I do with it. Before America had witch trials, Europe had werewolf trials. Some 200 years before the witch trials in Salem, Massachusetts, where I live, courts in Europe were convicting men and some women of transforming into werewolves and mutilating and eating children. The punishments were sometimes as gruesome as the alleged crimes. In Germany in 1589, executioners strapped accused werewolf Peter Stump to a cartwheel, removed his skin with hot pinchers, and chopped off his head before burning his body at the stake. Stump's head attached to a wooden pole carved into the likeness of a wolf was later displayed as a warning to others tempted to consort with, well, the entity they call the devil. The concept of humans transforming into wolves goes back millennia. Lovers turning ex-lovers into werewolves. In Greek mythology, King Lycan of Arcadia tests Zeus's omnipotence by feeding him disguised human remains and is turned into a werewolf as punishment. His name is the root of the term lycanthropy, used for both changing into a werewolf and the delusion of being one, a recognized psychiatric condition for several centuries. Charges that real people could be menacing werewolves surfaced as part of the witch trials that swept through parts of Europe in the 1400s. I wrote all about the witch trials in my book, Discovery of Witches. There's a lot to know and understand when it comes to that history, and I will be sharing that in a Salem witch trial seance in the near future. An Irish legend tells of a Catholic priest who gave communion to a dying werewolf. In the Middle Ages, legends and folktales full of monstrous creatures were popular. 
One favorite fearful image was the werewolf, a being that is half human, half wolf. The mythical creature is found in many stories in Ireland. The Irish priest encountered a real werewolf. He beheld a she-wolf who under that shape pouring forth human sighs and groans. On seeing the priest, having saluted him with human courtesy, she gave thanks to God. The priest was hesitant to give the werewolf communion, but eventually submitted to the request. There are many other stories from Ireland that highlight the presence of werewolves and reveal a more human side to the typical terrifying tales that most hear. The wolf was a female. It says here in the text, he beheld a she-wolf who under the shape pouring forth human sighs and groans. Have you ever heard of the topic? I was sharing stories with a friend of mine who I also consider a colleague in this field, someone trustworthy and knowledgeable, someone I respect. Her name is Brittany Barbareri. She is a cryptozoologist and a ufologist and a pretty hardcore researcher in the field. Um, it's actually quite refreshing to work with someone as knowledgeable on the subjects that I work on consistently, especially with clients. Well, one day we were sharing stories for hours between my cases and my EVPs and seance sessions to UFOs and aliens and cryptids, and she was as well. An interesting topic came up with her, and she was she started telling me about the Pope and how the Pope, well, they give rights to werewolves, and we're going to go over that, and I'm going to show you documentation of this. Every time I do a seance, every time I get a case, it leads me. I follow the clues and the puzzle pieces. You're going to be stunned at where this one led. Werewolves. So I told Brittany about a seance I did years ago, and it was kind of encapsulated around Ed and Lorraine Warren and their um, England werewolf. And their story was really interesting, and it was on Seekers of the Supernatural. Now come to believe uh, possession started was when I was nine years old. Suddenly the temperature just just dropped completely like in the winter, freezing cold. And there was a terrible stink coming in the air, like a, a sort of backed up or something. Then I just literally threw off the handle as I, I was mad at somebody. It just went a total rage, and I mean, a rage. Up until two years ago, Some Londoner Bill Ramsey didn't know why he would attack people, just like the Wolfman in the movies. Even a man who is pure in heart and says his prayers by night, they become a wolf when the wolf vein blooms and the autumn moon is bright. I had a very big bad attack and nearly killed a police officer at Southland Police Station. That was in 1997, July 1997. Ramsey was put in an institution. They ran all the tests, the brain scans, and all this kind of stuff. But all the brain scan can really tell you is not what's wrong with you, it's really what isn't. Ramsey said it got to a point where he can actually sense a change coming on. So he would drive himself to the police station, and the bobbies would lock him up. In here, he says, is where others would be safe. 
But the English tabloids found Ramsey and hounded him to reveal his real-life folklore of a man-wolf. He exhibited superhuman strength. That was an indication to me that maybe that was of a demonic nature. Thousands of miles away in Monroe, Connecticut, ghost hunters Lorraine and Ed Warren heard about the Ramsey case. The typical werewolf, all of a sudden, the flames come out, the air comes out, the full moon. I said, that's not the way it is. This is a possession by the wolf spirit. Intrigued, the Warrens went to London and met Ramsey. And after studying his case, they concluded the only way to rid Bill of his curse was through the religious rite of exorcism. It was performed in Monroe with the help of Bishop Robert McKenna. Approaching me and making the sign of the cross, and I started to shake. He would push his hand, he would pull his hand, I used a little claw, you know, trying to um, uh, resist the exorcism. And then he put the, his snow, which was wearing around his, his neck, and he wrapped it around my head, and I don't really remember too much. And then it was over. Maybe it was ordained to be me to make people aware that this demonic possession thing does happen. Real London police officers talking about being attacked by a real werewolf. He stands about 5'7", he weighs maybe 150 pounds, but he would take some of these bobbies who are well over 6 foot, over 200 pounds, he'd throw them around like they were kindling wood. How He would ask to be locked up mm -hmm. in a jail cell for his protection and the protection of the public. Now, the people out there listening to us right now are probably saying, come on, what are you talking about, a werewolf? Well, I think by the end of this program, they'll realize that Bill Ramsey was a real-life werewolf. Even if we find out that this man really is a werewolf, I'm not going to go before the public and start talking about a werewolf. Ghosts and haunted houses and demons and devils are bad enough. But now a werewolf and in London? You know, <laughs> who would believe it? But it actually occurred. Terry uh, Fisher was a sergeant on the English police department. He was one of the ones that was attacked by Bill Ramsey. Now this guy stands about six foot three, weighs about 250. Good shape. When I went to his house and I said, I would like you to come over to the pub with us when we interview Bill Ramsey. Mm -hmm. And he said, there's no, no way he wouldn't that I would go near that man. He said, I don't care if there's a hundred police around, I would not go near him. I came as close, he said, to dying as I ever did in any of my experiences in a police department. He would not go near him. I interviewed two other police officers. They would not go near Bill Ramsey. And I'm thinking, this guy must be pretty bad. You know, I'm talking with Bill in Boston. It's a television show. <laughs> and they gave us adjoining rooms. And Lorraine said, we should leave the door open for Bill so he can walk in and out. I said, Lorraine, this guy went right through the bars of a jail cell, pushed his head, shoulder and arm, through a 12-inch space. I am not leaving that door open. <laughs> Even after he was exercised. There's 12 cops can't hold this guy down. And then you want to leave the door open for him. To leave a door open for him, I said, no way. But I want to tell you, Tony, you've met Bill Ramsey. Yes. And he's a gentle, beautiful man. When he's man. Bill Ramsey. When, when he Bill is Ramsey. Bill Ramsey. But during the exorcism of Bill, on that July day in 1989 in that church, anybody that's listening to this program right now mm -hmm. that would find it difficult to believe that such things as a werewolf exist, they would have, should have been in that church. That I, th day. I think what we ought to do is show that. I, I was going to say, I know you brought a film. Maybe uh, talk over the film before it starts maybe and just fill us in real quick well, what it's about. Yeah, what we're doing here is now... Uh, Bill Ramsey's in our home. Uh, Kevin Hogan, uh, who was with a local television station, was there with us. We were talking with him. And he's asking Bill about how all of this came about. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill Ramsey tells him when he was a boy an experience uh, that he had one summer afternoon. It was a hot day. Mm -hmm. uh, he was in the backyard of his home. His father was a soldier 
uh, I think they call him Master. Uh, no, um, Major. Major at arms. Sergeant Major. Uh, Sergeant, Sergeant Major. Major. Tough guy, tough mm -hmm. guy. And so young Bill went out to the backyard, and he said suddenly it became very icy cold, and there was this sort of stench of something dead. At that point, he didn't remember anything, but his mother thought, looking out the window, said that this boy, this little thin kid, picked up barbed wire, uh, not barbed wire, but chicken wire, mm -hmm. that had been attached to posts and cemented, and ripped them out with his hands and tore the, bar the uh, wire with his teeth. Now, that's impossible to do, but that was the first mm -hmm. official report of him changing. If it were not for Lorraine and for Bishop McKenna, Bill Ramsey might be in a mental institution today. He might be dead. He might have killed somebody. That was one of his worst fears, mm -hmm. that he would kill somebody or hurt somebody so bad, and he would know nothing about it at all. And like cancer, it is a type of uh, a disease, but in this case, it was an actual possession. Now, when we talk about the wolf spirit, this means that he would react as a wolf would react. He had the strength of 50 men. I mean, this guy did feats that nobody could ever imagine. And, you know, every legend has fact behind it someplace. Your vampires, your ghosts, your werewolves. So Bill Ramsey is the only case that I know of that was a true case of a werewolf. Now, there are more werewolf accounts especially over in Maine. I've had a lot of clients in New Hampshire, even Pennsylvania and Maine, regarding Sasquatch, but the werewolf accounts are more rare. This one's really interesting though. During this particular werewolf encounter that obviously involved, I think up to five of them, the family saw strange white lights in the woods and only this particular time, which makes me wonder if it has something to do with UFOs and some kind of hybrid manipulations. I'm not sure. But then the family saw the set of eyes staring back at them after they saw these lights. The encounter was around 20 feet in distance from them. And here's what the document says there were three that were crawling towards us so I didn't see the five all at once I saw the three and when I put the light on them that's what the shock was even four seconds can feel like four hours you're just mesmerized and they got up they went sideways and they stayed all together and all I could think of the leg the thigh going down to the leg. The thigh reminded me of a kangaroo and the foot. What was odd about it, it had a very long arch and a heel like a human, and then it walked on. They didn't really look like toes as much as they looked like canine paws, with very long nails sticking out of it. And the reason I saw the nails is when they lifted their foot up. The dew was in the grass and you could see it shining. The color of their fur was a light brown and a very, very dark brown, and it was smooth on their body. And on their back, they had a hunchback. The fur was very smooth on their legs, but around their heads, it was wild. It was sticking up and tufty. I don't think it was matty looking as much as just unkept. Their ears were on the side of their heads and went straight up past the top of their heads. About three inches above, it looked similar to how someone looks when they cover their ears and their hands when they don't want to listen to someone or want to block out loud noise. Their eyes were huge and they were a greenish yellow fluorescent bright and the bridge of their nose was about seven inches. They were about seven feet tall. We measured from where he was standing by that 10 foot door.
So years ago, I had done a seance for many folks who were asking, and um, I asked if werewolf, werewolves existed. Look, I can't even say that. <laughs> okay. Um, well, they answered me. Um, they started talking about an ancient pack and so much more. Are werewolves real? We remember the case with Lorraine Warren. Are werewolves real? So this gets even more interesting as I go along. You know, I never really shared that with many people unless like anthropy comes up with a client or a subject. I don't really share these things. So here's something really interesting. I have met detectives in the past. I've worked with deputies all over the country. Um, and retired detectives have given me their own paranormal investigation stuff, you know, when that person and their spouse wanted to just kind of move on with their lives. Sometimes they don't always like to fathom everything in this field. And there was one group of detectives that found this big steel box in the middle of the woods. And I can't remember how they got to that point. But when they opened it up, they said there were chains, big chains on the inside, and that um, they could see claw marks, giant claw marks all over the walls. And it was just fascinating. And I just was like, oh my goodness, you know, I've heard these stories before. Well, this, you know, Brittany was telling me another similar story about the doors of the church. The gut-clinching black shuck. The enormous brute very casually broke the rules of demonology as it barged into the St. Mary's Church on a stormy night in the 16th century. It charged the worshippers and littered the holy grounds with bloody cadavers mutilated by its demonic teeth and claws. The story says that on August 4th, 1577, Black Shuck attacked the congregation of two churches 12 miles apart from each other. There are many folklore stories pertaining to ghostly black dogs of Britain. However, Black Shuck is specific to East Anglia, where it roams the forest and countryside. The most well-known story surrounding this demonic creature is the 04 August 1577 attack on two church congregations. On Sunday, August 4th, 1577, a terrible thunderstorm broke out in the town of Bungay. The storm was described as darkness, rain, hail, thunder, and lightning, as was never seen the like. The weakly thatched cottages of the helpless town folk were fiercely being swiped away its rage. The town folk hoped for a miracle to save them. They knelt at St. Mary's Church, the religious heart of the town, and prayed for help. As the people prayed, lightning struck the church. In that same instant, a gigantic black dog appeared before the entrance, showing its bloodthirsty fangs. What happened afterward is described by the following olden verse. All down the church in midst of fire, the hellish monster flew, and passing onward to the choir, he many people slew. Black Shuck dashed in, tearing off people's throats and strangling worshippers with its front paws. Heat radiating from its foul physique instantaneously vaporized anyone nearby. Then after satisfying his appetite with the horrified screams of masses, 
the dog suddenly disappeared, reappearing 12 miles away at the Holy Trinity Church. There it resumed its brutal activities, ripping the lives out of innocent victims. And it shows here what are the facts. Scorch marks on the Holy Trinity Church. Yes, I can see them. Records of the St. Mary's Church report a huge thunderstorm did break out on that date. Additionally, two people were found killed at the Belfry. However, there is no elaboration as to the circumstances and cause of their death. According to some people, the north entrance door to the Holy Trinity Church shows several scratch marks allegedly made by the claws of Black Shuck. Black Shuck description. Sightings of Black Shuck occur at historical cemeteries, ancient pathways, lonely forests, and old water bodies of England. It was also appeared, <clears throat> it has also appeared at traditional festivities and rituals. Its size is said to be that of a calf or a horse. The beast has blood-red eyes, glistening teeth, and shaggy black fur. Sometimes it is known to guard cemetery corpses and antiquated areas, whereas sometimes it is seen as an omen of death, foretelling the immediate death of the seer. Rarely, it also appears as a benevolent spirit guide and defender of the weak. So I take it upon myself one day. I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to do a session. I'm going to do a seance. I've kind of put the werewolf lycanthrop lycanthropy thing on the back burner for years. I did it with all sorts of cryptids. I always focused on angels, demons, ghosts, um, other little weird creatures that I've seen. Um, you know, and that was the majority when it came to my cases. But I think it's time that I share this and what I documented this past week. In seance, I asked, okay, spirits, angels, what can you tell me about werewolves? I hope you said something about the Pope in this. This one's the longest. They said, um, lycanthrope, um, antidote, some things that were inaudible that I just could not understand. Michael Vodun, Vodun, and I didn't even want to tag that or mark it in my EVPs. I could hear Michael clearly, but I was like, Vodun, Vodun. It was interesting. And so, I'm like, okay, I'm going to stop right here before I analyze any further in my analysis procedure. And I go and I type in basically all that statement. I found a story with a gentleman or an entity, a character called Michael Vodun Vodun. I can't really sit, pronounce that last name. It's so interesting that they mentioned this identity. And it, the story, it goes to where he was basically the one who made a deal with the devil himself, the entity, the devil, and became a wolf man. So I'm like, I cannot believe this. And I'm telling, I'm texting and voice messaging Brittany and another friend of mine about this. And we're just like, whoa. <laughs> So I'm like, okay, I'm going to get back to analyzing, and they said more. 
So if you just want to have a little bit of fun and dig deeper into this, it gets really deep when you dive into the werewolf trials that were before the witch trials of America. And that is where this Michael character is spoken of and much more. So after they mentioned this Michael, they said his werewolf hunted, hunted for the majesties. Am I hearing this right? And so I'm like, okay, let me just start with some of my books. And then I started researching in some other databases. And the Majesties are a group of extremely religious males. So after this, the spirits and angels that I work with, they told me, they said, the priest, they lied prideful guild and I'm like why would they say that this is very interesting and I wasn't really getting a good feeling when I was reading about these majesties So then they said, in the pack, a lot of loss. So this is all very interesting and it's all going into my one of my um, book of shadows where I document every response I ever get during seance of any any form whether it's during an exorcism or during you know any kind of rituals or my traditional seance sessions all right so to take this to a whole nother level biblically speaking there are verses in the Bible that I found regarding werewolves. I found some on vampires as well. That will be for part two of vampires. This book is from 1887. Hold on. No, this is 1913. I have my other one here from 1887. And this is a Bible. And I've got a couple of these. I just haven't packed them all yet. And I found in here those verses and I'm going to show them to you now. Right here. At that moment was the word fulfilled upon and from men he was thrust out and he ate grass as oxen and his body was moistened with the dew of heaven till his hair was grown like eagles' feathers, and his nails like birds' claws. So there's one. Okay, so here is Genesis 49:27. Benjamin will raven as a wolf, will raven as a wolf, as a wolf. In the morning he will devour the prey, and at evening he will divide the spoil. So that's another reference to werewolves. All right, so, yeah, okay. All right, so now it's Genesis 4, 7. 
Is there not, if thou dost well, a lifting up? And if thou dost not well, sin is crouching at the door, and toward thee is his desire, and thou shouldest rule over him. All right, Matthew 7, 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but within are ravening wolves. But within are ravening wolves. Wolves. Yeah. Look at that there. Okay, Matthew ten. And then it's um, 16 through 22. Let's see, it's right here. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Become therefore wary as serpents and guileless as doves. Now, I have a lot of EVPs about serpents, but I'll get into that later. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and in their synagogue they will scourge you. And before governors also and kings will ye be brought for my sake, for a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But whenever they deliver you up, be not anxious how or what to speak, for it will be given you in that hour what to speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father that speaks in you. And brother will deliver up brother to death, and father child, and children will rise up against parents and put them to death. And ye will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he that not endures to the end is the one that will be saved. That's interesting. All right, so here's Boston, Massachusetts. Here is Salem, Massachusetts, which city, okay? Here is where I almost bought a house, and I still may one day. But what's interesting is that is exactly where the werewolves have been sighted, over here in Dog Town, right in this area. That's crazy. I am literally there all the time, sometimes on a weekly basis. I've slept in my truck in these areas, and this is insane because the werewolves have been sighted on the cliffs in these areas. So I'm going to tell you the story real quick. Okay, I'm going to tell you a story about a man who encountered a werewolf and the men in black and what happened. Because I'm noticing some similarities with this story in Dogtown, Massachusetts, where people would eat a particular botanical and turn into a werewolf. But that's not the correlation. So let me read this to you. Dogtown in Massachusetts is a bona fide ghost town with a mysterious and fascinating past. Suspicious vagrants, wild dogs, witches, werewolves, old curses, and creepy dolls are all part of the legends that swirl around the eerie locale. You seriously won't believe this spot has been lurking just out of sight in our state for so many years. Settlers began moving to the area in 1693, mainly because the spot's inland locale granted protection from pirates and from hostile native peoples who were understandably annoyed at the uninvited guest. At its peak, 1750 through 1800, Dogtown played host to around a hundred families. After the War of 1812, most farmers moved away from Dogtown. Fears of coastal attacks were dwindling, and new roads were being opened between Rockport and Glister. I almost bought a house in Glister. Shh. 
should have. This is when all the trouble started. As respectable families took off, their abandoned homes began filling with vagrants and unsavory people looking for a place to lie low. Those without a family to follow also remained behind. <clears throat> Widows and some independent single women. Rumors began to brew that some of these had stayed in order to practice witchcraft. Strange booming sounds began to be heard coming from the town and travelers reported flickering lights and figures in the surrounding forest. And what about the name? Originally known as the Common Settlement, Dogtown got its name from the roving population of feral dogs that were known to inhabit the town. That's where the correlation is, and I'm going to explain this, but let me finish reading first. Many of the widows of lost sailors and soldiers kept dogs from or for protection and companionship. Whether it was the death of their owners or some more unexplainable force, these pets became feral and took to wandering over the nearby moors and howling. Some residents had particularly menacing reputations. Thomasine Tammy Younger was known as Queen of the Witches. Tammy lived on Fox Hill by a Lewis Brook and was reported to curse teams of oxen transporting fish from the nearby harbor as they made their way through the Dogtown area. Unless their driver paid her a toll, a toll I suppose that's one way to leverage nasty, you know, rumors. The last resident of Dogtown was a free man named Cornelius Black Neal Fenson. Horrifically, he was discovered half dead in a cellar hole during the harsh winter. Uh, Babson was relocated to a poorhouse in Glister in 1830. He died very soon afterward. Roger Babson, the founder of Babson College, commissioned out-of-work stone cutters to carve what were meant to be inspirational inscriptions on three dozen boulders in Dogtown during the Great Depression. There are 36 of these baffling and occasionally unsettling in in inscriptions scattered around the area. Early settlers of the area reported astounding levels of wolf activity. According to the late folklorist Richard Cahill, the local Aglum Indians stated that their ancestors actually possessed heads like dogs and that eating a special local plant could allow anyone to adopt the same canine features. In March 17, 1984, a Boston resident claimed that he witnessed a gigantic animal roaming the cliffs near Dogtown. I will be going there, so stay tuned for that. He thought it might be a mountain lion, but local wildlife officials insist no mountain lions live on Cape Ann. March 17th was a full moon. On March 21st, a dead deer was found on Crane's Beach. It had been torn apart but not eaten. That same night, near the road to Dogtown, two people reported seeing a, and I quote, gray, monstrous, dog-like animal running into the woods, end quote. Okay. There's also a toy cemetery that's really interesting. I'll tell you guys about it when I take you with me to Dogtown this ghost town. But what's really interesting too is that there were werewolf trials prior to the witch trials. So this is quite fascinating. So there's now I'm going to tell you about this man. So there's this elderly man and he and his brother and his mother encountered a werewolf thing. They spoke of it having an awful smell, just like Ed and Lorraine Warren. They saw it one night. Um, so their father wasn't home. They, they were in the south. They, um, they lived on a farm, a uh, farm ranch kind of, you know, situation. And one night their dad wasn't home and they could see this thing standing out there uh, 
they said it looked like an ugly man dog. Um, they didn't know what the hell they were looking at. It had yellow eyes. Um, they ran to the house, and when they did, they slammed the door, and this thing was growling and scratching all over the door and all these things and messing with the handle. Um, scared the mother, scared these two boys. They were getting their guns. Well, their dad had come home later, and because the thing had left, I suppose, and their dad came home later and said he was going to give them a weapon if they didn't stop lying until their mother intervened and said, no, I don't know what it was, but this really happened. You know, the scratching on the door, the hearing, the growling, you know, this really happened, she told her husband. So they kind of let it go. They went to bed. Well, one of the boys woke up screaming because I guess he could hear this thing outside later, late one night. And he runs to his mother and father's room and he says that there's like a big beast or something outside and it's upsetting the other animals so his dad tells him to grab the gun and shoot it so he does it was a whole there were there were so many more details forgive me i don't remember them all and anyways this is where it gets really serious so they shoot it they walk up to it and after they kill it and they're like you know, they, I guess they were, it was messing with their truck or something too, because they had shot through the truck and everything. And um, they, they go out there and they approach it and they said it was the ugliest looking human dog thing they'd ever seen in their lives. And they didn't know who to call. So they called animal control or something like that. It was some kind of animal authorities. And so um, at that point, they came out, they took the body because they said they were going to examine it, do all these things, and then they never saw the body again. They called for updates, never heard anything. Well, within those couple of weeks after the body was taken, um, they said they did see two men in black. Um, I can't remember exactly what was swapped word-wise. Um, I know that the son was out in the field and he was, he was doing something and all of a sudden all these dogs, vicious, aggressive dogs started running after him. So this young man runs over to his tractor, climbs to the top, you know, they're shooting the dogs, all these things that they had to do and they call animal control again and, um, you know, they took the dogs away. And what I remember what this old man said, and he really was not happy to talk about this. And it, it was a good, you know, 30, 45 minutes with all the details he remembered from his childhood. He said that there were never any wild dogs out there. He said they only appeared after these men in black, after this big beast thing, deformed beast dog man thing that they shot uh, was taken off and they never heard about it, saw it, anything again. Well, the same interesting thing is that they have all these dogs in this dog town story, right? Same thing. This isn't the first case where all these wild dogs just suddenly appear in the area. And um, the smell too. There's always this awful wretched smell around these werewolf things. The creatures, cryptids, I don't know. So, um, I think it's really interesting. So stay tuned because I'm going to go to Dogtown. I'm going to take you with me. I'm going to also do some sessions there if it's quiet enough. Apparently it's a ghost town. So we'll see. Okay. What can you tell me about werewolves?
I hope you said something about the Pope in this. This one's the longest. Okay. <coughs> Let's see what you said. Can you tell me about werewolves? That one didn't pick you up as much. I'm not sure if this one got anything. Thank you. <sighs>